Mr. Martinez, you may continue. Ma'am, Exhibit 448, we were talking about this uh, message there. Do you see that? Yes. Uh -huh. and then if we turn the page, or a couple of pages, we see the same message there, right? Yes. Uh, you don't know how that got there, do you? No. Ma'am, uh, in, in this case, you actually are uh, biased in favor of the defendant, aren't you? Do I believe the evidence that supports domestic violence? Yes. No. I, I think bias is an incorrect word, Mr. Martinez. No, that, that is the correct word. Isn't it true that you are biased in favor of the defendant? Yes or no? I don't believe I'm biased. Ma'am, do you remember that the first thing that you did upon meeting the defendant when you went to visit her was that you apologized to her? Yes, I did. And you apologized to her because you had read some of the items that were involved in this case, hadn't you? Yes. And you had already formed an opinion with regard to those items that you had read, correct? No, I hadn't. Well, it's fair to say, though, that the f apologizing to somebody when it's the first thing that you do sort of seems like there's sympathy on your behalf for whatever it is that they, is going on with them, right? Apologizing to someone for reading their most private <coughs> thoughts and things that they thought they would never have in public is also a way to establish rapport so that somebody's really able to talk to you. And that's what I wanted. I wanted her to be able to talk to me. But you actually meant the apology, though, didn't you? Of course I meant the apology. Right. So walking in meaning and meaning the apology, one of the things that you did was indicate to her, I've already formed an opinion. I am sorry. Right? Actually, no. Not at all. Overrule. The answer will stand. No. There was no need to apologize to her, was there? From my perspective, there was a need to apologize. So you felt so badly for her already that you felt there was a need to apologize then? I felt badly that I had invaded her private most you know, ideas and thoughts that I'd read. It would be like reading my daughter's diary. I would apologize for that. I didn't, I, I did that because I genuinely meant it, but I also did it because it's a way for her, perhaps, to trust me and to be able to tell me things that she might not tell me otherwise. So with regard to this apology, is that an apology that you extend to each and every one of your clients that comes in? I very seldom have read any, with, no, it isn't. Yes or no? Do you apologize to your clients when they come in? Objection. I'm finishing her answer from prior. Overruled. I apologize to Miss Arias for reading private things. I don't. Object is not responsive, Judge. I don't. I'm sorry. Sustained. Repeat. Do you apologize to your clients when they come in to visit you? No, I don't know anything about them when they come in to visit me. Ma'am, the answer is yes or no. They don't, you don't it's, apologize. It's not a complete answer, Mr. Martinez, and it's not a truthful answer, Mr. Martinez. So what you're saying then is that you can't tell us if you apologize to your clients when they come in, or you can I tell you that I don't because I don't know their stories and I haven't read their private journals and I haven't read their private thoughts. And so I have not, I have no reason to apologize. And knowing that you had read these thoughts, you felt so bad that you felt compelled to say you were sorry to the defendant, right? I felt badly that I had read things that were never intended to be read by someone else, yes. And feeling badly affected the way you viewed the defendant, didn't it? No, it did not. Well, if you feel badly about it, doesn't that mean that she's already got a little bit something on her side? It means that I have apologized. It does not mean that I'm, that I'm going to, I've apologized to clients if they've misunderstood what I said, but it doesn't mean I'm gonna change the way I work with that client. I'm not, I'm not asking you whether or not you're gonna work with that client. And, and the people that you work with, you are treating them, aren't you? Yes. You were treating the defendant, were you? No, I was not. There was no need to apologize if you're just going to assess it, is there? 
my judgment said that would be something that I would do. Where is it written in the rules, ma'am, or in any volume, anything that you can point me to, that you can say to me, when you first meet with a client in a forensic setting, you need to, you should apologize to them. I, I don't know that it's written anywhere, Mr. Martinez. That's something that you did in this case, isn't it? It's something I would do in any case where I felt the need to do it. I'm not asking about any case. I'm asking about this case. You felt a need to do it because you felt sorry for her, right? I wanted to do it because I invaded spaces that most people don't invade and that I, I felt to establish a rapport it would be a really good idea for her to understand that I understood that, that I was reading things that were never intended to be read by anybody else, and that if, I, if she knew that I knew that, that there would be a rapport there, and it did not bias because I had still made no decision about doing this case. There is a different, there are other ways to build rapport, isn't there? There are many ways to build rapport. And one of the ways to build rapport, of course, is to buy magazine, not buy, buy books for somebody, right? That's another way, right? Sure. And so when you're saying that you bought these books for her, that's just a way to build rapport, right? I've done it for other people in jail. Am I asking you whether or not you've done it for other people? You're, you're mischaracterizing what I do, Mr. Martinez, and I think it's really important for people to understand why I do what I do. Oh. All right, tell me what you don't understand about this question. Isn't it true that you bought some books for the defendant when she was in jail, correct? Yes, it's true. Isn't it true that this is the same defendant that you apologized to? Yes. Isn't it true that in order to build rapport with this defendant, you could have done other things, correct? There are many things you can do. You don't stop building rapport because you do one thing. I'm asking you, as a substitute for the apology, isn't it true that you could have built rapport a different way? I suppose. Well, didn't you tell us that humor was a way that you use in these domestic violence cases? Isn't that what you said? If I walked in and made a joke with Miss Arias when I first met her, Mr. Martinez, that would have been so inappropriate and so counterintuitive to building rapport. I'm not asking you to t whether or not you should have told a joke. Didn't I use the word humor, not joke? How do you do humor when you first meet somebody who's been in jail for four years? Ma'am, you're the person that's c conducting the assessment, aren't, aren't you? Exactly, and, and so I get to decide how I build rapport, Mr. Martinez. And that's right, but one of the things when you come into court, you get to decide what you do, but you also get to be questioned about it, right? Exactly. And one of the questions here is, why is it that you felt so strongly about her that you felt the need to coddle her by giving her books and apologizing? Why is it that you felt the need to do that? I'm sorry? Objection is vague then. Why did you feel the need to do that? Do what? Do you want a complete answer? I want an answer to my question. Which Why did you feel a need to do that when you could have established rapport some other way? I felt that that was a respectful way to talk to Miss Arias, as I do with anybody I work with, I find a respectful way to make a connection with them. I think it's important, and I think it's important for people to see that you have respect for them, regardless of what they're accused of, regardless of what they've done, that there is a respect that's basic to a human being. So I chose that way to do it. It was not something I had planned, Mr. Martinez, it's something that that happened when I was there, I hadn't given it thought, I hadn't, you know, said, gee, this is what I'm going to do when I see Miss Arias, I'm just going to apologize. It was something that I did when I was there, and when I purchased the books, and remember, I've been... That's beyond the scope of the question. No. When, I, when I purchased the books for Miss Arias, remember, I've been on this case for a year and a half. 
So during that time, I did that, and I've done that for other clients, I've done that for other people in jail, because jail is boring, and jail oftentimes doesn't give people the opportunity to, to be, have their minds stimulated, and I've actually done it with people I don't know who've written to me from jail. I've put together packets for them, because that's part of what I do, and I see it as preventative, and I think in a preventative way. So. Of those other cases that, of the individuals that were in jail, how many other times have you testified at trial in a criminal case? At trial in a criminal case? Yes. I've testified. I want a number. I, I know you do, but I, I'm not certain. I, I wrote down how many I testified altogether, which is 18. This will be 19. Some of those are in family law. In murder cases, I've testified twice. Yeah, I just want a number. I don't want you to give me a free flow of expression. I, 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 I'm not exactly sure. I would say it was less than 10. And in those 10 cases where you testified in criminal trials, ma'am, of those, did you apologize to every one of those people before you went, to, as soon as you went to see them? I didn't read their most private, they were so, different, they were different, there's different reasons, Mr. Martinez, it's, it's very different. You, you approach people the way, you, I've done different things, I've reduced my fees in one of those cases because I knew that people didn't have a lot of money. So I do different things in different cases, Mr. Martinez, that's the way I work. I don't feel like there's just a rote way of handling people or one size fits all. I feel like it's important to look at the person that you're dealing with and try to deal with them based on who they are and not some formula. Are you done? Or do you need to say anything else about that? I'm done. How many of those people that you testified in did you apologize on the first meeting? Objection, Your Honor. I don't know. One of them was 29 years ago. One was yeah. 27 years ago. I, I don't know if I apologized or if I didn't. I honestly, I don't. I, I, my first case was 84, and I, I remember going in and meeting with her in jail, and I don't know if I apologized. I, I can't imagine yeah. I did. All you did. have to say is you don't know. You don't know? Is that what you're saying? I would say unlikely because the circumstances were different. So this is a different case where you could have shown respect a different way, right? This case? Yes. This case seemed, it seemed to me that was a really good way to show respect at the beginning. I understand that that's what you say that you wanted to accomplish by apologizing, but there are different ways of showing respect, aren't there? Sure. You could have sat across from her and began talking to her about what happened in a very respectful way, couldn't you? I did that. Well, you could have done that, and that way that would have shown her that you were respectful, right? Yes. And in fact, you told us that 90% of all communication in a clinical setting is nonverbal, right? Yes, I did. I, I'm really sorry yes I said that, I guess. Or no. <laughs> yes, I did tell you that. So if you really wanted to show her the respect and show her that, that you were going to do this in a respectful manner, if 90% of the statements are nonverbal, you didn't have to say anything at all, did you? Overall. Untrue. So you felt that with regard to apologies, those are the only exceptions to your 90% rule? No, that's not what I said. Well, you did make the statement about the 90%, right? 90% 90, 90 and generally speaking, you, you start by talking with somebody and connecting with them before they have a context to, to even assess your body language. Well, ma'am, you spent 44 hours in this case, right? Yes, I did. So that was sufficient time in the beginning at least to assess, for her to assess your body language in that you felt respectful, correct? 
Not the first five minutes when I met her, no, Mr. Martinez. No one forced you to open your mouth those first five minutes and say, I am sorry, did they? I'm not sure that I did it within the first five minutes, but I, I did it relatively soon, and nobody forced me. No, right. they did not. And, and the five minutes that I just used, you were the one that just told me about it, right? That's the time that you told me, right? I did not. I don't know that I did it within the first five minutes, Mr. Martinez. I don't know that I did that. What I do know is that I did it relatively soon, but that we had no basis for communication prior to that. So if I had I sat silently, that wouldn't have worked. Did I have to make an apology? Probably you could say no. I would say I thought it was a respectful and good thing to do. It was my decision to do it. So you can argue with that decision, but that's my decision, and I believe it was the right decision to make. We believe that you, it was the right decision, but if your statement is true about the 90%, isn't it also true that, well, how long did you meet the first time with her? It wasn't five minutes and it wasn't 30, was it? It was more than that. It was eight hours, I believe. Right, and in the first time that you met for eight hours, you could have, through your body language, this 90% rule, after maybe one or two hours, attempted to convey this to her through this nonverbal communication that you have talked to us about, right? I think I probably um, apologized to her before two hours. I understand that, but my point is you didn't have to apologize immediately upon walking in, right? No. You could have waited one or two hours to see how she dealt with you to see whether or not she was going to trust you, right? I guess I'm not sure why this is such an issue. Judge, she's being non-responsive. Dained. Ma'am, you understand that you're here to answer my questions, right? Yes. So my question to you is, in terms of this apology, it's true that it wasn't necessary within the first five minutes or the first half hour because you spent actually eight hours with her, right? I felt that it was necessary, that's why I did it. I understand that you felt that it was necessary, but you weren't compelled to apologize, were you? It Objection has to be answered several times. And during this conversation, you, you talked to her about what happened, right? Yes. And during this conversation, one of the other things that happened is that you had a really good feeling about her, right? I had a more positive feeling than I did prior to meeting with her, but I don't know that really good. I had a much better feeling about her after I spoke with her. Isn't it true that you and I had a conversation back on November 14th of 2012? Yes, it is. Isn't it true that you indicated to me that you looked at the materials, and you received a lot of information, and you had a good feeling about her. I did. I said a good feeling. I did. And so this good feeling that you had about her, again, this is on a personal level, feelings, isn't it? It was, yes. She answered questions that I had. Um, she filled in blanks that I had. Right, and so as a result of that, you developed, if you will, something inside your brain, which is the thing that creates the, uh, the, 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 the um, testimony that we have here. In there was a good feeling. You apologized because you felt bad. Now you have a good feeling after talking to her, right? A, a good feeling. I have a better feeling to pursue the case, for sure. I'm not asking about a better feeling to pursue the case. I'm asking about a good feeling about her because that's what you told me, that you developed a good feeling about her. Do you remember telling me that? Y yes, I do. Yes, I do. And so now, not only have you apologized, now in your mind, which is what you've told us how you arrive at your opinions in this case, something that we can't look at, correct? We can't go inside your brain, open it up, and look at, at the way things develop, can we? No, but you mischaracterized what I said. I understand that you, you, you believe that. So now you have this good feeling, and then you continue on with the case, right? Yes, I do. 
Isn't it clear to you, as you sit here today, that perhaps there's an issue of bias on your part, on behalf of the defendant, given your feelings and what you've done? No, I don't believe that there is. So you can set all these good feelings aside then, right? I have good feelings. characterizing what was happening in the interview with regard to good feelings. Overruled. Right? I think that, that what you're talking about is that I have positive feelings and that would really interfere with my look at some objective material. And I'm not saying that I'm not a human being and I'm not affected by good feelings. I'm saying that I look at lots of things because I take this case very seriously. It's a very serious case. But in this case, there are no objective materials, are there, like a test, are there? I don't think tests are objective. So you're saying, for example, if we have a DNA test, that's not objective. I'm not talking about DNA. I'm talking about, I thought you were talking about psychological testing. No, we're testing. talking about things like that. No, I'm, no, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying that I look at materials that are written from a variety of sources, including Mr. Alexander, and I took all of that into account. I and didn't just take... Miss Arias' words into account. One of the things that you told us, or you told me during the interview, and you told us during testimony, was that the defendant suffered from low self-esteem. Do you remember telling us that? Yes. Well, now, one of the things that, with regard to uh, low self-esteem, um, isn't it true that, true that when the defendant was about to be evaluated, isn't it true that she was happy because she believed that her IQ was as high as Einstein's. Do you know anything about that? Yes, I do. And in fact, that speaks against somebody who has low self-esteem, right? Not necessarily. So the fact that the defendant was happy to have her IQ tested because she believes she's on the level with Einstein doesn't indicate to you that this individual does not suffer from a low self-esteem issue. Most people who talk about how smart they are don't feel that they're that smart or they're really interested as, by the way, I, I did do testing as an undergraduate. Uh, when I did my practice test, people were very interested in their IQ because it's interesting. So there could be a number of reasons why she was excited about that. I don't know I wasn't there. Well, but the bottom line is you had it in your notes, right? You read that. Right. Yes, I did. And you're saying that, well, all these other people have these reasons why they want to know what their IQ is. You don't know that's why the defendant want, wanted to know about her IQ, right? No, I don't. Because you didn't ask her, right? No, I didn't. And it could be that she has a very high self-esteem, and she believes it, and this is going to be confirmation for her. Objection, speculation. Overall. That she is smarter than almost anyone else. I don't believe her behavior demonstrates high self-esteem, Mr. Martinez. You're talking about behavior. We're talking about an IQ test and, and her indication that she believes that her IQ may be as high as Einstein's. Self-esteem is not just about IQ, Mr. Martinez. Right. It could be about other things. For example, one of the things that we know about her is that whenever she had an issue with people, she would correct everybody's grammar, right? There were people who said that, yes. Well, this is part of what you read going into this interview with her, right? The first interview, right? Yes. And so you now know this information. You're walking into this interview knowing that she's corrected other people with regard to their grammar, right? Actually, I don't know that I had read that yet. I'm not sure. I was given a limited amount of information prior to going into Seamus Arias. And I can't exactly tell you which things I was given a year and a half ago prior to meeting with her. But at it's, least you now know that that's something that is out there and you have in your notes, correct? Yes. So now we have a situation where she believes she's intelligent, she corrects other people's grammar. Isn't that an indication to you, ma'am, about somebody who has a high sense of self? Not at all. 
right? The other thing, ma'am, is that, uh, do you remember when she was in jail up in Wairika and the defendant's manifesto? Do you know anything about that? I don't know anything about that. Do you remember that. that that was in your notes? I remember hearing about it. I've never seen it. You haven't seen the manifesto. I'm not asking if you've seen the manifesto, but you've heard about it, right? Okay. I've only heard that there was a manifesto. I don't honestly know anything about it. And I understand you may not have seen it, but isn't it true that the defendant was signing or autographing copies of the manifesto? Objection. Anyway, coach. Continue. Now, with regard to this manifesto, I, with regard to this manifesto, I understand you haven't seen it, but um, in your notes, doesn't it indicate that the defendant actually signed copies of the manifesto to <coughs> distribute in case she became famous? I believe those were in my notes. And again, if that is true, doesn't that speak against the idea that the defendant lacks self-esteem? No, I don't think it does at all. I think you can also have self-esteem issues in particular, in particular areas of your life. But I don't think because somebody writes something and thinks it's great, she may think she's a good writer, and that may be part of feeling good about herself because most of us have areas that we feel good about ourselves, but it doesn't mean we have high self-esteem in the rest of our lives. You're also familiar with the results of the M M M MCI, correct? The test. I took notes on it, but as you've already mentioned, I'm not an expert in testing. Right, but you did note in it when you were talking about self-esteem, right? You took note of what the results were on self-esteem. Yes. And you actually thought it was important enough to write them in your notes, right? I took notes on everything that was in the test. But as you said, I'm not an expert on testing, so being able to interpret that is another thing, but I did take notes on it, sure. I'm, I'm not asking you to interpret it. I'm asking whether or not your notes reflect that the defendant has no self-esteem problems. That, that was at that time, which was years after she left the relationship. I, you know, one of the things about the testing, if you want to bring up testing, it was done after Miss Arias was in jail for a, a significant I, period of time. I understand, but there's a test that says she has no self-esteem problems, right? Objection. The scope of the test works. Overruled. Right? There's a test that says that, right? I... If I wrote that in my notes, then that's what I wrote in my notes. Do you want to look at your notes? Sure.
read all of them if you want, and then let me know when you're done reading it. Are you done? Yes, you're looking at hey, social. I'm sorry. If I may have an athlete. Sure. This is a page which is a copy of your notes, correct? Yes. And this is in your handwriting, correct? Yes. And one of the things that it talks about is the MCMR, correct? Correct. You looked at it, right? The MC. I looked at the, the reports. Sure. Yeah. And it was important enough for you to look at that report so that you could include it as part of your assessment, right? Correct. And in it, you looked at the social functioning scales, right? Right. And you found in your own handwriting that they were within the... It's a testimony with regard to what's in her notes about something that's not an app. That it was in the normal range, right? Or social functioning. That's not the same as self-esteem. Well, it does talk about self-image, doesn't it? It says it's within the normal range. Right. And we're in it. Her self-image is within the normal range, correct? Correct. And you're saying now that somebody's self-image doesn't have anything to do with self-esteem? Judge, objection. May we approach? Yes. Yeah. May I continue? You've now told us that this was self-image was within the normal range, correct? Correct. So we now have an individual who has a test that says her self-image is within the normal range, correct? Given two years after the incident. I, I understand that, but that's what it says, right? Within the normal range at the time it was given, correct. That's, you've said that before, we assume that. We also have an individual who's very happy about being tested because she believes that she's as smart as Einstein, right? Objection to the testimony. Sustained. That her IQ is as high as Einstein's. Same objection. Yes, she says that. And she's signing manifestos because she believes she's going to be famous. 
I don't know if she believes she's going to be famous, but she's signing manifestos. Do you want to look at your notes where you indicate that? If I said that in my notes, then, it, then it's... No, I'm asking you if you want to look at your notes so that you can make sure that you're accurate. You want to look at yes. them? Yes, yes. All right. Take a look at the exit at six zero three and read it to yourself for the Yes. I'm going to ask that you go out to the jury room for approximately three minutes. Only three minutes, so don't go far. We'll bring you right back. Please remember the admonition. record will show the jury has left the courtroom. We are in recess for three minutes. Three minutes.
All right, let's bring the jury in. Ms. LaViolette, please take the stand. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. You may continue. Have you had a chance to review Exhibit 603? Yes, I have, Mr. Martinez. And uh, with regard to this 603, it's an important page, isn't it? It's uh, the you mean the statement about the manifesto no, or the whole just page? just the page. I, I read the highlighted section. Did you want well, me to read the entire sorry, page? Go ahead. go ahead and look at 603 again. Okay. I just ah. was reading the highlighted. And ma'am, with regard to this document, it, it does say important page, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And the page is eight and a half by 11, correct? Correct. And in this is the issue involving the manifesto, right? Correct. It's at the top upper left-hand corner, correct? It's what? It's written about on the upper left-hand corner at the top, right? Right. Look, the stained rephrase. Well, with regard to this page, there is an upper left-hand corner at the very top, right? Yes. And on the margins on the upper left-hand corner, don't you reference the manifesto? I didn't look at the upper left-hand corner. I looked at the body of sure. what was written. Sure. Just take a quick look. You see that at the upper left-hand corner? Yes. Yeah. You do reference the manifesto, correct? Yes, I do. And then this issue of the manifesto and the signing and all that is in the middle portion, correct? Correct. So this is something that you considered important. I did. And with regard to that, isn't it true that the defendant asked somebody named Amy to print out two copies of the last page of the manifesto and had them signed? Objection to your All right. Had them signed in case. Objection to the floor. Approach, please. You may continue. Isn't it true that the defendant signed those, according to your notes, in case you became famous? Objection. Objection. We just discussed. All the rules. You may answer. That information I received from Amy. Ma'am, it's Amy. yes or no. It really is. It's a yes or no question. I didn't get the information from this area. Judge, she's just not. I, I got the information from Amy, and, and she said that, yes. So are you saying Amy is lying? No, I'm not. I'm saying I didn't get it from the serious. That's I'm, I'm not asking you where you got it, did I? Okay. All I'm asking you is for the substance of it, right? Right. And you had no reason to believe that Amy was not telling I the truth. I didn't have a comment on the letter. Overruled. Right? Right. 
in terms of, Judge, do you want to do the other thing that we talked yes. about? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take the evening recess at this time. Please be back in the designated area at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Please remember the admonition. You are excused.